Good morning, everyone. This is Diana Maya with uh, Hope Hispanas Organized for Political Equality. I'm the Youth Programs Manager. Um, this presentation is being recorded, or this webinar is being recorded. Um, for instructional purposes, um, it will be housed in the Hope uh, website. Um, also here with me is Belinda Bergen, our Programs and Policy Director. Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you for joining us today. Um, I will, uh, in a brief moment, introduce our guest speaker, but I just wanted to remind you that you can um, input your questions into the chat box and I'll be monitoring them from there. There'll be a couple of instances in the agenda where you can ask questions. Um, again, this is a presentation on the 2020 census. Um, it's larger implications on redistricting. redistricting. Um, this is a continuation of a conversation that we had at Latina Action Day, if you were able to join us then. Um, we were uh, talking about, or we began our conversation around um, the 2020 census. Um, so we hope that you have uh, joined us with a lot of good questions. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, presenter. His name is Stephen Ochoa. He's, with, he's a National Redistricting Coordinator for MALDA. Um, and that's all you're going to hear from me. So Steve is the expert, so take it away, Steve. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, on the phone. Uh, thank you, Hope, uh, for having me. Uh, uh, I have a, I'm a big fan of, the, of your organization, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and uh, my, my wife is a Hope sister. I don't know if that makes me a Hope brother-in-law. I don't yeah, know. I will ask Helen uh, whatever her, uh, her classifications are. But uh, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Diana, for inviting me. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for, for joining uh, to, have, to talk a little bit about census and redistricting. Um, uh, MALDEF uh, is just finished celebrating its 50th anniversary. Uh, you know, as an organization, we call ourselves the Lawyers for the Latino Community, uh, and we do a lot of wonderful work. Uh, one of our his, our historic uh, areas of expertise is in the area of voting rights. Uh, so, and our, you know, our litigators have been working on this census and redistricting since our founding. Uh, so this is gonna be our, what, fifth cycle. Uh, and uh, as an individual, this, I have already gone through two redistrictings. Uh, I am Malta's demographer. I do our election analyses, uh, and I basically provide our attorneys with the various information they need uh, for uh, any type of voting rights litigation, or to the best of my ability, at least. And then, uh, and uh, so uh, I am. So I do our line drawing. I do our census education workshops, or our redistricting education workshops. And uh, you know, yeah, I am. I work with stats a lot. So I, I thank you all for uh, joining me, and I will do my best not to bore you with all the stats too much. Hopefully, some fun ones though. Uh, so and so today. Uh, I'm, we're going to talk about basically three things. Uh, we're going to talk about Census 2020, what's coming up. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how that affects what redistricting it, what is redistricting, how, how the census affects it. Uh, a little bit of what redistricting 101. And then I'm going to finally, I'm going to conclude uh, um, with uh, a, a discussion about the California Citizens Redistricting Commission. Uh, which is taking uh, applications right now uh, and why it's important for people and in particular many uh, on this uh, webinar or listening to this webinar to apply. Um, we, I'm gonna, I will actually do my best to go as quickly as I can because I want to be able to answer questions. Uh, I will take a, a few pauses in between each of these, sec these two sections to answer a few questions, but definitely, uh, so I'll pause after the census to talk a little, answer census questions, I'll pause a little bit after redistricting and talk a, take a few redistricting questions. And then, uh, but then after, after everything, I will we'll open it up for a free for all. And uh, hopefully I can, uh, you know, pass along some good information to you all. I hope this sounds uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so that said, uh, let's start with the census. So very simple, what is the census? <laughs> Uh, it's a constitutional mandate. It's actually in our U.S. Constitution. Uh, we, every 10 years, the federal government has to count the total population of the United States. That means every person, that is every man, woman, child, citizen, non-citizen alike. Uh, the census will, have, it will be conducted during the year 2020. And when you fill out your census form, you are filling out your information uh, as of 
April 1st, 2020. So that's called census date. So when the census data comes out, it's technically giving the information on that date, uh, depending on people to, uh, to uh, <laughs> answer that question. What does the census ask? So, and, and I wanna make clear that I am talking about, there is a, there's a census and then there's other, cens there's other census bureau related questionnaires. I'm talking about the actual census. It's a very short form. They basically ask about 10 questions and all they're asking is, they're gonna ask for your name, your age, your birth date, uh, your gender, your race, which is a separate question than your ethnicity. <laughs> uh, race is white, black, Asian, uh, uh, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander uh, or Native American or other. Uh, and then ethnicity is basically, are you Latino or not? Uh, basically Latinos uh, are, you know, come in all races. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of uh, mixed ancestries in our background. Uh, so we have many different races uh, and that's why it's a separate question. So, uh, and then and the other thing to note is that the race question, they do allow you to select multiple races for each person. But we're, you know, more and more the concept of mixed race uh, uh, Americans and residents are, is coming up. So you, ever since 2010, 2000, uh, you've been able to uh, answer multiple races. Um, you know, and it'll, add, and it'll ask, so, you know, any, one person per household will fill out the information for the entire household. You know, so you, you'll list, you know, all the people who live with you in your household. Uh, and then, you know, and then, they'll, and then they'll ask you, are you a renter or an owner, owner of your uh, housing unit? <laughs> uh, there are other census questionnaires that the Census Bureau conducts. And these are more detailed, but they do not get sent. They are not required. Uh, they are, not every household in the U.S. is required to answer this. Uh, the most common one is called the American Community Survey, or ACS. Uh, and that is a, uh, that's the one that you'll, you, that's the survey that will ask things like income or citizenship or, you know, plumbing in your home. Uh, you know, it asks a lot of questions, uh, but it, it's, it's basically, it, it many, much less, uh, it's a sample survey essentially, and they, and they extrapolate. Uh, but the census form by itself is very, very simple. Uh, and just this is just, this is a California call, uh, so this is just a little bit of just a few statistics on uh, what California has looked like over the last uh, few census, censuses. Uh, you know, you can see the Latino uh, bars going, uh, starting to go up, 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 <laughs> and then you you're starting to see you know the Asian American community going up, up, up. The uh, the white community starting to fall in total numbers. And then in total numbers, the African-American community stayed about the same. So, you know, this is just, uh, you know, just to show you, you know, we're, you know, Latinos basically went from about, uh, you know, almost 8 million to now almost 14, 15 million uh, in our last SACS estimate. So uh, we'll find out in census 2020 what that, uh, that raw count will look like. But that should give you an estimate of where California is trending. And then the next uh, slide. Uh, and this is just another, just a comparison, just to show you how we've changed in the last uh, nearly uh, third, uh, uh, 30 something years, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, Latinos, you know, in 1990 were 25% of the uh, population and now, and now we're estimated to be the largest population group total, of total population uh, in the state. And the state has gained about 10 million people, total people, uh, from 1990 to the most recent ACS uh, uh, survey. So, uh, and, you can, and then obviously the next shocking thing might be, or is that the, the non-Latino white population, because remember, we have to differentiate between uh, uh, Latino and non-Latino for, for the race categories. That's what the NL stands for in these tables, uh, has fallen basically from about 57% to 37%. So uh, this just to tell you what is the story in California, uh, in particular for the Latino community, but for others, and you know, obviously we're getting, we're a majority minority state now. Why is the census important? Um, 
So the census, again, it's federally mandated in part because it's, uh, this is what uh, the federal government uses to uh, what's called apportion uh, the number of congressional districts for, this, for the U.S. House of Representatives. So there's 435 uh, congressional districts in the, in the nation, uh, and, and they, the number of seats allotted to each state is based on total population. Again, total population man, woman, child, citizen, non-citizen alike. Uh, so obviously if for, for California or for wherever, whatever U.S. state it is, it's important because this affects your representation in the federal government. Uh, this is also the data that is used for redistricting. Uh, we're going to talk about redistricting a lot more later, but redistricting is the redrawing of political boundaries. So, you know, you need, you know, if this is basically creating your legal block set, you know, after a while, you know, you, you're creating new hard plastic Lego blocks, and this is what we're going to get, uh, you know, and California will be put together in a certain way, and then this, these are the Lego blocks we have to play with. Uh, and so obviously how some areas will be gaining more Lego blocks than others, and that affects uh, how we redraw our political boundaries. Uh, aside from representation issues, you know, uh, is, uh, is, you know, this census data that was also used in a variety of programs, federal programs, and often state or local, what have you. But census data is used often for the allocation of funds and resources uh, for various programs. You know, uh, just an example on fe uh, federal programs, you know, Medicaid, SNAP, uh, Medicare, Section 8, Title I grants, special education grants, uh, you know, CHIP, Head Start, just some samples of federal programs that use census data to allocate funds to the state. Um, you know, and then some states, depending on, you know, laws, will use census data as a base for how they implement or allocate uh, resources. Uh, so that's, you know, so this is, this is very important. If, you're, if you have an undercounted area, you're pro you might be getting less resources than you should have because not everyone in your region filled out their census form. Uh, you know, and then finally, you know, population data just generically can also just affect where resources are allocated. If people are, urban planners are using, are trying to figure out, oh, hey, where's a population boom happening and we might need, I don't know, a bus stop <laughs> or more buildings for X, Y, or Z reasons. So, you know, the census data is, a base is a baseline data set that is used for just so many things, and uh, it's important to have an accurate count. Uh, else, this is how groups get their fair share. <clears throat> Next, so um, you know, you would think just a simple form, ten question form would, you know, sent to everyone in, in the nation would have no problem, be, you know, be very non-controversial. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there are a variety of things that can affect what's called the undercount, as I mentioned earlier. The, the you know, how many people a census misses. Uh, so the goal of the Census Bureau is to count every man, woman, child, citizen, and non-citizen alike. You, I, we will keep repeating that phrase a lot. Uh, and, you know, the Census Bureau, you know, the people who actually conduct the census, you know, they're dedicated, often dedicated people who want to get a good count. They want to count to everyone. That's their goal, 100%. But, you know, when you're dealing with this massive project, you know, people get missed. So, uh, so there are things that can cause people not to fill out the census or not, or either they don't choose to not to, or they miss it uh, because they don't get the information. So, uh there are important issues that are happening that could be affecting the census 2020 uh, and what could potentially affect an undercount of communities. And really when we're speaking about undercounted, it's traditionally underrepresented communities. Latino are, as a group are usually one of the most undercounted groups, Native Americans, immigrant communities, children, the homeless. There are a variety of constituencies across the nation that are more likely to be undercounted than others. But these are some, up but in general, some issues for this census that are different from in the past uh, could affect why people, why an undercount might uh, it could happen, and why you know this census is really you know it's been a fight, uh, and, and in some instances a needless fight.
but there's five. Uh, one of the, I mean, a few changes I will m mention. Uh, this is going to be the first census that's where the Bureau is going to be funneling people towards the internet to respond. Mm -hmm. And this is a big change. Even before everything else you've heard in the news about the census, this has happened way before uh, the current administration was in place, uh, this change. Uh, and the Census Bureau is, you know, going to be trying to use technology because they're trying to cut printing costs and therefore budget. But basically in the past, every household in the nation was sent a form, period, a paper form, and then you're supposed to fill that out and return it. This time everyone's going to be sending like a, a, like be sent like a postcard reminder saying, hey, go online to fill out this form. And so, you know, anytime you change a system uh, that, uh, you know, anytime you move, you change a system that can affect people and particularly, you know, underrepresented people. <laughs> so this is going to, this is going to be a big challenge that could affect undercount. Uh, you know, and anytime you have the internet involved, you have sometimes a, a confidence in the technology issue that could uh, make people question whether or not to fill out the form. And again, you should be filling out the form. Uh, so that's an, that's an issue. Uh, and then, but in general, this census has been very uh, politicized. <laughs> uh, so we have now a lot of public confidence and trust issues to also overcome. Uh, I'm sure you, many of you heard in the news about this issue of the citizenship question. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Trump administration attempted to put uh, a citizenship question, are you a citizen or not, uh, on the form that goes out to every person in the, every household in the, in the nation. Uh, and, you know, advocates such as Maldef, litigants, <laughs> key word, such as Maldef are, you know, fought to the nail. And just yesterday, finally, the administration gave up the fight to put that question on this 2020 census uh, form. Now that's important because, again, the more questions you have, the less likely somebody is to fill it out. But if you have a community, a vulnerable community that uh, does not particularly trust their federal government at this moment, you know, it could cause a household to think twice about filling out a form or filling out a question. And if you don't fill out a form or don't fill out a question, that actually triggers uh, somebody coming and knock on your door to answer those questions as well. So there's a whole, it, it, it causes, it could cause a cascade of issues that could cause vulnerable communities, uh, and particularly immigrant communities, to not fill out that form. So this was a, it was a big win to get this excluded. Uh, you know, administration would say citizenship was important for uh, voting rights compliant, understanding compliance with federal voting rights laws, I mean, and yes, that that is true. But we that data is got is 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 gathered from the American Community Survey, <laughs> and has been confident confidently gathered in by other metrics. Then you don't need to sabotage the actual census form itself with this question. Uh, members, the whole point is that you need to count every person, man, woman, child, citizen, and non-citizen alike. So it, you know it's the Census Bureau's responsibility to make sure you ask some basic questions, but you also want to ask questions designed in a way that, <laughs> that will engender people to fill out the form because that is the best way to get a count. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, confidentiality. Just want to stress that the, the, the census ha is governed by confidentiality laws. They cannot share your pers personal data with anyone. Uh, you know, even though you're putting your name on this, uh, the form is kept confidential for 72 years. So in 72 years, yes, we will know your phone number. <laughs> and where you lived, uh, but uh, not now, not anytime soon. All the data that will be released will be in, uh, tallied uh, data. <clears throat> okay, so what can you do to help ensure and to promote a successful census? Very simple. First, fill out your own form and encourage all your friends and family and anyone you can talk to to fill out their form. Uh, there are, again, there are laws to protect the confidentiality, uh, of this information, it's not going to be shared with anyone. It's not going to trigger robocalls. Uh, if you don't fill out your form, that's actually when you get a door knocker. So uh, if you don't want anyone knocking on your door, you know, then uh, you know, just fill out this form. It's quick. It's easy. It's safe. Please do it. And frankly, it will ensure your community help ensure your community get its fair share of resources that we discussed. Um, Next level, though, is you can encourage your local governments, your governments, to participate in in census outreach. You know, it is a, it is to every city and states and jurisdictions benefit to have a successful count because 
they want their fair share of resources. So, uh, you know, and representation in Congress, you know, so California statewide is doing a lot of work, uh, more than last cycle. Um, but there it's, but this is going to, this is, as you've been following news, an uphill battle on, and battling trust issues. Uh, so we can always do more. So just encourage participation wherever you can. And finally, again, you know, you can, there's a lot of trusted actors like Malda and uh, other community-based organizations that are going to be conducting a census 2020 participation programs. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, we could always use support there. Uh, you know, it's, we, we're in the middle of the fights of our lives, uh, for our representation, you know, help your uh, local CBOs. So with that, I will take a quick pause if there's any census related questions, I'll take one or two questions. And if not, we can move on to redistricting. Um, Diana. So a reminder to put your questions in the um, chat box if you have any. Let me give it a minute. Did you, well, Belinda has a question so here. In terms of the American Community Survey that you say they send in addition to the small form, is that mandatory to fill out? Uh, when you get it, and so the ACS uh, is actually sent out, uh, it is not sent out to everyone. It is not, it is, and it is sent out at random sample over five years. So every year though, some, you know, a, a group of households will be randomly selected to fill it out. So it's a big giant survey, it's a survey, you know, so not everyone gets it. Uh, when you do get it, uh, it is kind of considered, you know, required to fill it out. Uh, it is more complicated, but frankly, that is such, that is the detailed sample survey data that frankly we use for, for voting rights. So, uh, so eventually uh, a five-year average of these data is released on small levels. And that is what we use to for uh, voting rights compliance. Uh, so uh, not everyone's going to get it. In the past censuses, like uh, from 20, in 1990 and 2000, there were actually two forms. It was called a short form and a long form. So uh, and, and then Congress eliminated the long form because uh, you know the long form tends more questions tend to have a higher non-response rate. So uh, now they just do a rant, rolling sample over period of five years uh, to get national, like that type of long form detailed data. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Susana Razo and her question is, how many years is information confidential again? Uh, 72 years. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we have a question from Megan Elizondo and she, her question is, I believe you mentioned this, what happens if a form is returned but is incomplete? Uh, that is, uh, so <laughs> if a form is uh, incomplete, so that was like uh, that was like the big question on when we were battling what we were trying to come up with. What happens if the citizenship questions on it? But people will fill out everything but not answer some questions. I, I believe it still triggers enumerators knocking on your door to kind of fill out that some of that information. So that's why another reason why it's important not have that very very invasive question on that on the form because uh, you can just answer the basics and a lot of the, the race and ethnicity questions have a other don't want to answer type of uh, option um, but uh, yeah basically it could trigger a door knocker if it's very incomplete. okay and then our final question is from Andrea Guevara and she asks do you have to be a certified person to help people fill out the census or hold workshops um, so this first, uh, the, sen if, uh, the Census is Bureau itself is hiring. <laughs> uh, and and they, this is like the one, you know, every 10 years, the, the Census Bureau just staffs up to hire all sorts of people to conduct, to have hotlines and door knockers, enumerators, and, you know, to hold workshops. So uh, you don't necessarily have to be a certified person to encourage somebody to uh, fill out their form. I'm not certified in anything other than I just work with the data. Uh, and I know, and I believe in its, the importance of filling this out completely. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, but there are plenty of organizations and the Census Bureau itself and the state, their state have uh, what are called complete count committees. There's sometimes there's county complete count committees. And there are groups of people who are also dedicated to trying to work together to help uh, encourage people to fill out the census. And we have um, another question that came in asking around, asking about homelessness and how they're counted um, since they don't have an address. Yes, that is so. Probably the most undercounted uh, 
and vulnerable group that is uh, undercounted is the homeless. Uh, basically, uh, the, from the, what the census does is they literally will dedicate a weekend and they go, they send people out to count the homeless. So in urban areas, they go to Skid Row, they will go to missions and shelters, uh, and they try to, they literally hand count people uh, and enumerate them that way. And that's really the only way that, uh, that's the most common way. I mean, technically a, a person can go and go to say a public library and get a form and fill it out. Uh, but uh, that is, that's what they do. And it is of course far from the best solution, but that's what they do. And other, and other groups like the county, uh, county of LA, for example, do, does a homeless count similarly like every year. And that's how like say counties and states uh, get some of like annual homeless counts. But, and I'm sure you've read many of news about like increasing homelessness over 10 or five years or three years. And that's usually based on state count processes or local processes, but the census will use a similar process where they literally just send out people to help count the homeless. Okay, we have two more questions that came in and then um, we're gonna save the rest for um, the end. Um, the next question is, how does this affect business owners in their local communities? Um, again, it's about resources, uh, your county people where you live, um, you know, it's, I can, you know, it can track, uh, you know, if you're, if this is, if your city is developing and suddenly a large population shows up from previous 10 years, I mean, that affects allocation of bus stops or, or you know, lights or housing developments, uh, you know, uh, fed, you know, federal programs are often dependent on census data. So, uh, I, you know, I can only say it's, it's an indirect thing. But, you know, if your community, if you're a local business owner and you want to support your community, you know, you, again, I would urge you to encourage your community to fill out the form. Uh, you know, have a flyer on your shop window if you can. Uh, just uh, that's something you can do because it, I, I'm sure as a business owner, if, if you're a local business owner, a small business owner, you're, you're, you want to help out your community where your business is based, uh, helping them get funds and resources, else they are not. And I imagine not getting funds to resources in certain areas would affect a business. And then the final question is actually uh, about the jobs, I believe with, with the census and they're asking what these job titles are, is it field rep? We can send out a link at the end or, um, with the recording uh, with how you can find more information about how to work uh, to get people to fill out the census. Yeah, I'm sure there's an, an employment opportunities uh, section on the census.gov webpage at minimum. But I think we can find that. Okay, so we're gonna um, keep going, and then again, you can continue to send us your questions um, through the chat box. Right. So that was the census. That was the easy topic. <laughs> that was just counting people. The message there: please fill out your form and be counted. Census data, once it's completed, will lead towards the redistricting process. What is redistricting? Very simply, it is the redrawing of political boundaries. You, it, it, that's all it is. Um, why do you have to redistrict? Well, again, it is related to the census and a uh, law. Basically, the Constitution has been interpreted, interpreted that if your ju jurisdiction has district systems, so your state legislature, your city council, your school board, if they have districts, the law of the land is that all districts m must have the same amount of people. That's again, every man, woman, child, citizen and non-citizen alike. Because the concept is that each representative should have the same amount of constituents within it, uh, principally. Uh, you know, if you, have, if you never change your district lines, you know, think about just demographics and the, the California data I showed earlier, your demographics, the composition changes, some parts of your state or city grow, some parts don't. Uh, so if you have the same, the set of lines that we have in place today, uh, that were set in, that were put in place about 10 years ago, are now out of balance again. And so once the census comes out, we have evidence that they are out of balance. So we have to, at minimum, reset them to equal population. It's called the principle of one, of one person, one vote. 
And this is why redistricting happens every 10 years because it has they wait for the census, which is the most accurate uh, total population database, and then you have to reset. Uh, you know, and then for Congress, it also triggers reapportionment. So California currently has uh, 53 congressional districts. Depending on the census, we could gain, lose, or keep the same amount of districts. Uh, and so you still have to reset those districts, whatever the ideal po the number is, back to equal population. Um, so next, why is redistricting important? So again, at minimum, you're resetting the lines for equal population. But that's like, that's the very, very shallow uh, definition. What it, why it's important is because how you draw the lines uh, determines who gets elected in that district. Uh, <laughs> You know, and uh, therefore it influences which voices in your jurisdiction's community get uh, uh, voices in the government. Uh, you know, and you know, and you know, tradi traditionally, you know, redistricting can determine which under and underrepresented populations do or do not get an opportunity to elect candidates of choice. So redistricting is an opportunity to affect your government for the next ten years. Uh, you know, given whatever branch of government you're talking about. That's a lot of resources and allocations, constituency services, uh, what have you, uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, so, you know, and obviously, and how the lines affect your representation lines. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is just a very simple, like, you know, demonstrative, like of how, you know, lines matter. So again, the principle is equal population. So these lines, imagine this, I call this Imagination City. It's a very imaginative name for this jurisdiction. And, you know, the whole, the goal of these city council members is there's four districts and they should all have about four people. Uh, so if I go, if I draw the mic like, on the left, yeah, you know, they, those are equal populous or nice and compact, uh, you know, but you'll notice that the green people uh, are separated from me from the uh, kind of the gray people at, at, at separated from each other. So they really could, couldn't, uh, elect their candidate of choice in any of the districts on the left. But if I draw them, if I draw shapes like on the right, I can draw a district around the green people, they suddenly have a chance, uh, they, you know, they represent a, a quarter of the city and they have a chance to now control a quarter of the districts in their city government. So how you draw the lines can affect uh, which groups get a voice. Uh, and next slide. And similarly, just to hammer home again this, our census issue, uh, a census undercount can also lead to uh, unintentional disproportionate representation. So let's just say, in this example, uh, the, the ones with the, uh, the uh, strike through, the people with strike throughs are people who did not fill out a census form, right? So from my Excel sheet, I see that the city on the left, the city, sh the district should have about three people. In reality, there's like more, but I don't know that because people didn't fill out their form. So I can still uh, draw equal districts, like on the left, but if I do something like on the right, yes, the green people will have a chance to elect candidates of choice, but that representative will in reality have like two times more people than the districts, you know, to the north and the south. Uh, so just because there, a census un does not count you does not mean the people aren't there and that your representatives don't have to deal with them as constituents. So this is another reason just to kind of to example of, again, to put how redistricting and census in concert together could lead towards uh, poor representation. Uh, but again, how you draw the lines uh, matters. Who draws the lines is probably the next question. Uh, it varies, uh, and it varies on your jurisdiction. In most instances, uh, the state legislative body will redistrict themselves. Uh, your city council usually redistricts itself. Your uh, school board will usually redistrict itself. Uh, and it usually undergoes a process like passing a law. You know, they'll hold some, a few public hearings. It's like a bill. It's like passing a bill. And if they're, they're good, they'll usually do a more transparent process. Not always, but they, it's basically like passing a bill, uh, you know, uh, and you know, but the, at the end, the council members or the school board or, or the state legislature that's, uh, will pass their own laws. Uh, you know, it's the most common process. Uh, an increasingly uh, 
a process that's increasingly uh, developing is the concept of redistricting commissions. And then there are what are called independent commissions, and then there are advisory commissions. So an independent commission is basically a commission that actually has the final authority to say, we're drawing the lines this way. An advisory commission is often like a group of appointees, like by a city council or school or board. And they they go do like the legwork, they'll do the community uh, listening tours and the workshop and listen to testimony. They'll probably draw a draft plan, but ultimately they're going to kick that draft plan up to the, the, the legislative body, like the city council. They, city council could still change the plan, but they have the final vote. Uh, uh, so that's an increasing uh, comment. And then often, and if, the, and if redistricting gets up in litigation, sometimes the courts will have the final say. <laughs> Uh, you know, each process will have kind of its own uh, pro and con because each body will often have different priorities. Uh, a legislative uh, process, <clears throat> you know, usually the body is a larger and so therefore has a chance to be more reflective of your jurisdiction. California has 80 assembly members and 40 senators, so that's 120 legislators. Technically, probably more have a chance to be more representative of California's diversity, which we looked at earlier. But con, they're probably yeah, and to be a little bit more self-interested. So therefore, so they might not be, you know, trying to be uh, following, you know, drawing for communities. Um, co redistricting commissions, uh, usually, depending on, again, and it, it depends on the commission itself, how they're selected, they're often community focused or, you know, more straightforwardly focused, uh, but they can be partisan as well, depending on the body. Uh, uh, but they're usually smaller than your state, state legislature. So, you know, uh, the California Commission has 14 members. That's, has, that's gonna be less, there's less opportunity to be uh, 14 members be representative of 40 million people than say 120. Pros and cons, and, but you know, they're also not gonna be drawing for districts they're gonna run for. So uh, there's lots, it's an understatement to say that there's are trade-offs, uh, but they're not, no process is perfect. Um, <clears throat> So that, but basically that's who draws the lines. What are the rules of redistricting? I'm not gonna spend a whole lot on this because I, I just, other than just to, to, to get across the point of that there are rules, but the rules can be conflicting, but there's many things you have to take out. There are two, key, there are two big rules to redistricting though. Big rule number one is the concept of one person, one vote. That's again, equal population. That's why we redistrict. Big rule number two is compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act. This is the law that under certain circumstances and a lot, a lot of statistical analysis is needed to prove it, uh, you are, your jurisdiction is forced to draw a majority minority district where the community has a chance to elect a candidate of choice. Uh, and then after that, there's, unless a, unless a jurisdiction has specifically ranked criteria like the state, California State Commission, there's a bunch of uh, what are called traditional redistricting principles that courts acknowledge are part of the redistricting process but there's not necessarily a clear mandate of one over the other. Uh, and this is where the interest of the drawing body usually manifests itself. You know, so the concept of, like, for example, MALDEF, when we draw, we draw for communities of interest. Uh, you know, we want to keep as many communities of interest as possible, together as possible, and those are, in our opinion, self-defined. You know, there's the concept of contiguity. Your district should be all one piece. Uh, imagine if your district line is a rubber band, you can stretch it, contort it into different shapes if you want, but as long as you don't break the rubber band, that's technically a continuous, contiguous district. Uh, but related to shape is that the district should be compact. What's the shape of the district? You know, you don't want it, usually you don't want a snake, but, <laughs> you know, but squares and circles are also very unlikely too. So it depends on your, what your region is. Uh, you know, you, you want to follow boundaries like mountain ranges or canals or rivers or railroad tracks or political jurisdictions like your city lines or your school district lines, depending on what you're dealing with. And then considerations often used by others, and this is where the concept of gerrymandering, or in particular political gerrymandering comes in, is you can still, t it is still technically acknowledged that you can consider incumbency, and there I mean like the home of your city council member or, or member, and then the concept of partisanship, that actually deals with the electability, who elects uh, uh, the candidates. Uh, you know, so makeup and, and et cetera, that's partisanship or, or sometimes cities are nonpartisan. It's still the politics. Uh, 
And just as I mentioned, and this is not a slide, but you know, California actually has, has ranked these criteria. Their ranked criteria are uh, one person, one vote, the VRA, three, contiguity, four, communities of interest, and they specifically state you are not allowed to uh, consider partisanship or incumbency, uh, then compactness, and then something called nesting, which uh, was basically the concept of if you have 40 uh, sen Senate districts and 80 assembly districts, you have try to try to put two assembly districts together to make Senate districts. But frankly, because of all the other rules, it is never, it's ignored. Uh, <laughs> it just, it's not feasible or practical. Um, and then just again, just looking at this slide, I just want, you know, you're seeing all these rules, you know, redistricting is tricky because as you, you probably, I'm sure as you're looking at this list, these rules kind of have competing mandates. And this is why redistricting is also kind of an art. Uh, for example, if I wanted to have my districts as equal in population as possible, like, you know, uh, sometimes that might, if I'm drawing state legislative districts, and, I, and, this, is, and this happens in congressional district redistricting, where the, you can't have, your difference has to be plus or minus one person, not percent, person. That, you know, you're usually going to be cutting communities of interest or cities to reach that just perfect equal population. Uh, if you give yourself a little bit more leeway, you know, you can have more of a chance to preserve a community of interest. Uh, so uh, complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act sometimes forces some communities of interest to be cut, uh, you know, uh, and sometimes, uh, a, you know, our redistrictor is so focused on keeping a community of interest together that, you know, it could potentially cause a voting rights vi violation. Because sometimes you have to split up a community to make sure you might be a situation where uh, the Latinos, for example, could have two districts in any region, but they're only drawing into one. <laughs> uh, and so, and the VRA basically has rules that if they can actually have, under, uh, if you do all your analysis, if you have the conditions that they have to have two, they can have two districts, you do have to draw them. So, but that's a, so there, you know, there's competing mandates, you know, all around. Uh, and this is why redistricting is, is, is tricky uh, at times. Uh, and I'm not gonna go too much into these, and I'll happily answer questions, but this is where, you know, people's eyes gloss over. So I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I will advance for a little bit. Um, the last thing I just do wanna talk about is the concept of gerrymandering. And this is where, this is where I, a redistrictor, want, want to just uh, uh, <laughs> mention, a, a, so gerrymandering uh, is the concept of drawing districts to give one uh, group an unfair advantage over others. Uh, you can have partisan gerrymandering. You, do, you can do racial gerrymandering. But most of the time when people talk about gerrymandering, it's partisanship. Uh, first, so again, gerrymandering occurs within redistricting. Please don't call me a gerrymander. It hurts my feelings. I'm a redistrictor. <laughs> I actually do try to draw for the community. Uh, but I do want to say that, uh, you know, Sometimes people just only look at a shape and think it's, oh, that's a gerrymander. You know, it might not be because sometimes you're following boundaries that are a road or river that looks funny. You're following the coastline that looks funny. Uh, you know, or you're trying to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which is not a gerrymander. It's not gerrymandering. That's just complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act. But sometimes districts do have funny shapes and you have to look beyond just the shape and look at all these rules that are in front of you to kind of determine why are they drawn this way. And that's why sometimes redistricting is just not as straightforward as like, oh, look at this funny shape. <laughs> okay, uh, next. Okay, um, and again, just to, this is just, uh, again, to remind her how the census feeds into redistricting. Uh, you know, you use da redistricting data, but then you also will use election and registration and results uh, to sort of look to analyze, and that's that's what you the information you use to analyze for compliance with the federal voting rights act. It's much more complicated than that, uh, but I just wanted just to show you, just to kind of keep linking it together. How census, an accurate census form filling out, uh, affects your abil uh, our ability to draw districts by mandated by the federal voting rights act. If the Latinos aren't there on paper, you know, then I can't prove that they're there, and therefore I have a harder time to draw. Uh, districts where Latinos uh, can elect candidates of choice. Okay. Uh, what can you do to support successful redistricting? Uh, 
very simple. Just learn this, learn some about your, your jurisdiction rules and processes, and we discussed some of them today. Uh, you can organize your communities to participate. Again, in most instances, this is like passing a bill. So, you know, just as for any type of bill or legislation, you want to organize, get people all on the same page, get as many people to say as, the same thing as possible, to tell them to advocate for your community to be kept whole, or your community or for the jurisdiction to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, et cetera. And then ultimately this organization must be sustained so you can continually testify throughout the process. And remember, you know, it's every jurisdiction that's districted will be going through redistricting. So if you have city council districts and state legislative districts, you have two processes that you're, you know, gonna be carrying and needing to follow. Uh, and then finally, you can, again, like the census, support community-based organizations that will be conducting redistricting. Uh, MALDEF, uh, in 2010 was the only group in, for, in California to submit complete statewide plans for the, set, for the Congress, Assembly, and Senate. Uh, and we're gonna do that again. We're gonna work with, in conjunction with other groups as, to try to make a unity map if possible. So, uh, so people don't try to pit minority groups against each other because frankly, at the end of the day, we often have the same interests. Um, you know, and that's a very powerful advocacy tool. We helped our commission on our statewide work last time, helped with our LA County Board uh, advocacy last time. Uh, so, it, you know, organized support and supporting us, groups like ours, uh, is a way you can help support successful redistricting. So, that said, uh, I, well, I'll pause to answer some generic rules about redistricting, but I am going to be closing after this about uh, talking about the California Redistricting Commission itself. Uh, so uh, if you have generic redistricting questions, I can a answer a few right now, uh, but then I'm gonna talk about why it's important to apply to the state commission. Um, I have one question about, uh, that came in uh, to see if we can actually share the slides. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically the slide where you had, where you had the, the gray and green folks, uh -huh. they, that helped them understand, so they were wondering if we can share that with them. Um, I have no problem. It's I, 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 I am at the, I am at the, it's at the generosity of our Hope Sisters, so <laughs> if they wish to send, share with you, uh, I am happy to share. Uh, okay. Obviously, you can also contact me directly, and I'm happy to answer any questions you want as well. <laughs> awesome. And then, um, I had a question. So, I, I remember seeing last year that there was a, the, the Kern County was being sued because of how they had split up their county districts. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, does the census data impact the drawings of county lines as well? Yeah, any political jurisdiction that has districts must go through redistricting. Uh, and then once the, draw, once the lines are finalized, groups like MALDA will analyze the districts and say, hey, and look for Voting Rights Act violations, basically. That's the, and that's our, because that's our biggest uh, tool for advocating for an, an, our underrepresented community. So that is MALDEF litigation that was successful. Uh, so in 2001, uh, I went during their redistricting process said, hey, Kern County, you have only one Latino district out of five. And I, here's an example of two. I, you guys probably have a voting rights act violation. I think you guys should take a moment, redraw, look at this redraw, because you might get sued. They passed their lines right then and there, uh, and they passed status quo lines where and they drew, and a the Latino community, which previously was separated basically into three districts, uh, they just kept status quo, and uh, and then they yeah, and then they advanced. So Maldives sued eventually, and there's no statute of limitations on a, on a voting rights lawsuit, so you don't have to file right then and there. But uh, but we sued, uh, and we showed in court. Uh, hey, they, you guys could have drawn two districts and the, date, the more modern data, frankly, is even showing even more <laughs> the citizen, mm -hmm. modern citizenship data because again, the ACS comes out every year. So that, we, that data keeps getting updated over the decade. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we won. And so the Latinos have an opportunity to elect two, to control two districts out of five. Uh, and Kern will have to redistrict again but they're probably gonna be paying more attention to where the Latinos are uh, next time. And I th hopefully other counties will be part, uh, paying attention as well, or, and city councils and school boards. Okay, so we have a question from Gina Gage. She'd like to know uh, if she would qualify. Um, so you're gonna, we're gonna go into the redistricting commission yes. qualifications. Yeah, yeah, right I'll now. answer that later in a minute. Um, okay. 
Um, any other questions about specifically the um, the process of redistricting and its importance? Did you have any? Okay. Oh. So we're gonna move on, and then if you if any come in, we'll have, answer them at the end. Okay. I thank you guys all for making it through this far. I know it can be dense. I'm doing my best to make it as streamlined as possible. Uh, and of course, keep those questions coming in. So, that said, the California Citizens Redistricting Commission, or I'll call it the CCRC, uh, in two, in 2000, for the 2010 cycle, uh, I, and we call them cycles, um, California implemented a redistricting commission. 2000 was a super partisan gerrymander the voters passed a commission and took the power away from the legislature and made it a commission. This commission is in charge of drawing your state congressional, Senate, assembly, and board of equalization districts. It is made up of 14 commissioners uh, and it is legally mandated to have five Democrats, five Republicans, and four anyone else. Uh, and anyone else basically are your decline to states or third parties. So basically your decline to states. Um, So, and, uh, and right now the application process is open, right now. And, it, and the initial application process is open until August 9th, so we've got about just under a month. Uh, and uh, after, after you do this initial application, it will be just a simple 10 minute, uh, 10 minute questionnaire. Uh, we'll ask you some basic questions. Uh, and then once you get into this, then you can, we'll have the chance at the larger uh, essay and letter of rec process, which I can describe later. Um, but the application process is open right now. Who can apply? So first, you have your basic, you have your basic uh, restrictions. Uh, anyone, California it has to be a California registered voter. You have to have been consistently registered since at least 2015, last five years. You have to have the same political registration. So you can't have been going from Dem to, Dem to Reap or to decline to state. You have to have been consistently Dem, consistently Reap, or consistently third party, or consistently decline to state or no party. Um, the last five years, and you have to have voted in at least two of the last three statewide November general elections. In this instance, you're, we're talking about November's 14, 16, and or 18. Two out of those three. So that, that's the first pass. And that and when you go to when we look at the data in a little bit, those are what are called the tentatively tentatively eligible. <laughs> Next, what makes a good candidate uh, for uh, the, the commission? Uh, first, basically, they call it relevant analytical skills. Basically, you know, are you, uh, as you probably got a sample from redistricting 101, you have to understand a lot of dense things uh, and a lot of technical things. Uh, or a lot of things are going to be thrown at you. Uh, and obviously, if you apply, Maldiv will be here to help you understand things to the best of our ability. Uh, you have to be able to participate in public hearings. Uh, the last commission, they did, and every commission will be different in terms of time commitment. The last commission, like, they probably did, like, 30-plus hearings uh, for, like, seven to eight months, uh, you know, and they went up and down the state get, get, getting testimony, giving people the opportunity to give their input, to, they, all, they took publicly submitted maps to look at them, and eventually they, they, they took all that and they drew their plan. So, and that obviously leads to their bullet point, you have to be able to resolve complex problems. As I touched on briefly, the rules of redistricting have bunch of competing mandates so at some point there's a balance and trade-offs and there's only one state and not everyone will be happy <laughs> at the end of it um, the ability they ask for the ability to be impartial uh, and they ask uh, they ask for the you have to have an appreciation for California's diverse demographic demographics and geography uh, so yes be you know embrace diversity if you are anti-diversity, probably not going to make a good candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Who cannot apply? And this is, I think this leads to the question that was you, you asked a minute ago. Um, so in the last 10 years, if you or a family member, and the family member is, is like your son, your daughter, your parent, I think a grandparent, um, but uh, basically you can't have been an elected official. <laughs> You can't have been appointed or paid staff for any state office or congressional district. So any state legislative, a state office, you know, you can't have worked for the secretary of state or the governor. Uh, um, 
if you've contributed more than 250, 2,500, sorry, 2,500 uh, in any single year to any single candidate <laughs> uh, for a, during a calendar year, you can't have been a registered lobbyist, uh, you can't have basically been part of a campaign committee or a political central party committee. Uh, you know, so basically the whole point is that the, the, the spirit of this law was they were trying to root out quote unquote politics. Uh, you know, uh, if you're a local elected official, you are not disqualified. It only applies to state office, just to mm -hmm. clarify. So technically the LA city council members, you know, I mean, assuming they haven't, they aren't doing all the other stuff, which they are, uh, <laughs> to run, but you know, the mayor of Southgate, uh, for example, assuming that they don't have the other restrictions, et cetera. Um, and so it's, again, it's a lot of restrictions, but basically the concept is, you know, if you're politically active, they kind of discourage you. So, uh, where are we now? And I, I just, so I just want you to throw a few demographics at you. So the, the chart on the left, this is as of yesterday morning, the composition of the tentatively eligible. So the people who are for filling out the application right now online are basically asked those, just those first questions. Are you registered to vote? Have you voted in two of the last three elections? You've been consistent. Uh, and so far, Latinos only make up about 11.4% of that group. Uh, compared to our citizen voting age population, technically the universe that is, you know, 18 and over and citizen, they're technically the people that could register to vote. You know, we're at 28, sometimes 30%, depending on the, the, the CVAP you're looking at. So that's the biggest difference right there. The next group that's kind of le much less than their proportion is the Asian community, the Asian API community. Uh, so Latinos are, uh, yeah, very uh, underrepresented in the current uh, process, in the current application pool. So that's why I'm really, really glad that, uh, you know, you Hope Sisters have allowed me the chance to tell these wonderful Latinas to, to start applying or telling, getting the message out. Because if you look at the next slide, let me break that down a little bit further. When I actually break down by, the, by race and ethnicity and gender, <laughs> The most underrepresented group compared to the CVAP are Latinas. Latinas are basically 14% of the state, uh, and, but only 4.5% of the applicant pool. So that's a big difference, 10% difference of your share of the state. And the next uh, most underrepresented group are Latino men. <laughs> so that's about 7.5% underrepresented. Then followed by you know, Asian women and then uh, and Asian men. Uh, the most overrepresented group, I know it's a shocker, white males. <laughs> white males, I, I know, I wouldn't have guessed that either. White males are only, uh, <laughs> what are we? We're only, uh, 20, uh, 20, are only 23, 24% of the state's CVAP population, but make up 43% of the applicant pool right now. That's 19.5% to over. That's almost double their share uh, of the state pop CVAP population. So, uh, my wise Latinas listening live and on tape, uh, you know, call to action, you know, uh, if you feel we, we are looking for some smart, qualified, dedicated, civil, civic minded, voting rights minded people uh, to do this very important work. Um, you know, and uh, Latinas in particular are the most underrepresented. So back to the, the message uh, is apply. So if right now, just fill out, if, even if you're thinking about it, just fill out the application right now. It's a simple one, because that takes you to the next step. And that's when, then that's when the, 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 the state auditor who's governing this process will really start looking through and then asking for essay questions stuff. But you have no chance of, you have no opportunity if you don't just fill out the simple form. You can still say no later, but you can't say, you can't say yes later. You can't say no, yeah, and, and yes later. So, so please apply. Uh, if you know people, uh, in particular, wise Latinas, or frankly, uh, or, and, and uh, geographically, LA County is the most underrepresented compared to their share of their state, of the state. Uh, I can give you figures later if you wish. Uh, you know, just uh, yeah, apply, apply. If, even if you're just like a quick consider, just do it now. It's, it's five, 10 minutes. And then later, that starts the, the real thought process of, all right, can you do it? And Maldif would be here to help you guide through that process if you're seriously considering this. Uh, but we really need to get the message out uh, to qualified candidates. 
And that is my email address. Uh, thank you for making it this far. I am now, we open it up to all and any questions. Uh, I went as quickly as possible so we can have as, as much as 30 minutes of questions uh, or as little as you want if everyone is really hungry. So, uh, <laughs> but please, what can, I, what can we do? Okay, what so, made sense? <laughs> so we have a couple of questions. Um, so someone's saying that there are uh, an elected assembly district Democratic delegate. Would they would that prohibit them from participating? Uh, I maybe I will double we will double check with the state auditor. Very likely, <laughs> uh, but let we will let's check the state auditor's webpage. Okay, and then and email me if you need me to ask on your behalf. Okay, um, I know there is a question that came in before we even started the webinar that someone was asking if being appointed to a state. Uh, advisory committee or commission would prohibit them from being um, considered, and that's something we're going to look into as well. Uh, I believe so, yes, though. It, the, the, the restrictions do say uh, if you have been appointed to uh, a, a federal state office, which includes any state board or commission. Mm -hmm. So if it's a state commission or a state board and you're appointed, that probably means you, unfortunately. Uh, but I hope you know some really good civically minded uh, people that you can. Uh, draft. <laughs> um, but we, if you want to double check, I still encourage you to fill out the form online. They will just, they will do, the auditor will do your, their due diligence. Don't worry. And if you actually do, if you have a question mark, apply, they, they'll probably strike you <laughs> if, if you really do have some of these conflicts. So if you aren't sure, I still say apply. There's no, you're, you're not breaking the law by applying it. Okay. Uh, it they'll, they'll do the due diligence. Okay. And next question um, is, uh, do you do you know the reasoning behind why the political party consistency requirement? Um, so why do they want you to be five years as a Democrat or a Republican? Um, well, uh, the the proposition authors, uh, you know, and Maldiv was not a fan of this commission because of a lot of these restrictions did limit the uh, the comparative Latino population pools. You know, again, we're, Latinos are about 40% of the state population, but only like 26% of the total reg, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, the, the concept was that uh, they wanted people who were consistent. Uh, like, so they, didn't, they wanted to kind of like guard against, oh, if you're a Dem, or if you're a Republican, so suddenly switching your partisanship to Dem, so therefore you're not a real Dem, uh, mm -hmm. or a real not declined to state. That, that's kind of, I believe that's the, that was the thought behind why a five-year uh, no change in partisan registration. And then the vote history is supposedly because they want active voters. Uh, that, again, those are the author's reasons, uh, and, and, and that's basically the, the concept behind it. And that's just, but it is the law, it's just, it's the law of the land that we have that regardless of reasoning, so uh, please still apply if you are qualified. Okay, um, I think the next one is an observation, and I don't know if you have any insight, but they said um, that the African American uh, vote on, on the CBAT seemed low. Uh, what do you mean? Um, I don't know. I think on the, on the, on the pie chart. Um, so African American CBAP, uh, no, I mean, that's, uh, that's like, just to give you generically, uh, African Americans are only 5.6% of the total population. So, uh, and then if we look back to our pie chart, um, or I'm looking back, going back, I mean, they're what, at what, probably around similar percent. So they're, they're just a hair higher than their population rate, but yeah, that's just a, uh, that, that, that's the total African-American numbers at this point. Uh, so, yeah, CVAP, they are, yeah, 6.8% of the CVAP. They're only 5, 6% of the total population. Mm. Okay, let's see. African-American population, if you remember from the earlier slide about the census, total population has been consistent in, new, in numbers. Uh, so at about, you know, at about what? Uh, about 2.1 million, 2 million African Americans in the state. But the problem is that everyone else in the other groups are increasing, like Latinos and Asians in particular. So their percentage share is, has been shrinking over the uh, the last 30 or so years. Okay. 
Um, the next question is uh, specifically about the position or the application. Is it a full-time position to be on the redistricting commission? Uh, every commission, the commission will be setting their own schedule. So every body will set their own uh, hearing schedule and participation. Rate. So if the body, if the commissioners as a group decide they really, really want to get a lot of testimony, they will schedule more hearings, kind of a, a, at their prerogative. Um, so you. Will have you would have a vote in your schedule, but it is a good, it is a good time commitment. I you know when it, when you're doing the peak, like community of interest general testimony gathering before even drawing even happens. You know you are traveling up the state probably at least for about two months mm -hmm. uh, up and down the state. I would say uh, I could see you doing, you know usually on the weekends, probably one or two during the week. Um, so. It, it, it is a time commitment. Uh, I didn't put it in the slides, but they do give you a stipend for every day you work. I believe it's $300 a day. Um, so it's a matter of how much work the commissioners put in. Uh, and at the end of the day, in the last 14 members had a varying amount of, you know, uh, stipends, you know, you know reimbursed. Uh, but um, it is a good time of commitment, so that's why it is also a challenge at times to get people to participate because you have, sometimes you have to have a job that will flexible or is understanding. Uh, but there are a variety of people in the last commission with a variety of jobs. Some were school teachers, some were lawyers, some worked in. Uh, I mean, some were retired, uh, but it was a variety. Um, you know, so it's it, 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 so it's a time com it is, will be a time commitment, I think, if you want to do it well. Yeah, um, I think the uh, other questions I'm seeing are also around time commitment. Is it volunteer? Is it paid? Are expenses covered? So I think he just answered that. Um, there is one question about um, uh, uh, about LGBTQ uh, population population representation, but I don't think I saw that as something that they were gathering. Um, they the uh, if you look at my the the table I had with the which I broke down by gender uh, the uh, they. The application actually is tracking uh, what they call it non-binary. Uh, I don't think they add specifically uh, LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. I apologize if I'm getting the acronyms wrong. Uh, but uh, the that community is, I mean, it's it's not, like I was having this discussion earlier with your Hope sisters. It's like, usually I don't, you know, cause about the challenge of breaking down data by gender, right? Often they are, have to do their own because things are broken down by Latino usually, but not Latino female, Latino male. So uh, that, that so uh, other breakdowns are usually a little harder to gather. Uh, they, it's, you know, it's not, because um, it's not something you can usually redistrict because uh, usually gender is when you're drawing, it's, the, the region is 50% gender split usually. So you can't like draw a female district because it's there, it's integrated in that regard. Uh, but uh, LGBT, uh, I don't believe is asked. Uh, I don't, I'm sure that could be part of your story though when you apply, because at a certain point, this will be an essay and letter is a rec, uh, you know, and that's gonna be part of why your story, and you know, that is a diverse component of our wonderful state. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, our next question is, someone wants to know um, if, who selects the commissioners? So the state auditor is, is in charge of, um, and if you can go back to the apply slide, uh, if you don't mind. They are the, the group that is in charge of, uh, of the application process. So, they, so they're, that's the web page, uh, and they're, they're nonpartisan office. They are only gathering, they basically do take care of the application process. So after this initial process, then they're gonna kind of like narrow down, they're gonna go through the applicants, strike out the people who are disqualified for the partisan, the political reasons. Then they're gonna like have people do an essay, letters of rec and everything. Then they're gonna go through that and they're gonna cull it down to about 120 people. So they're gonna create pools, Democrat, Republican and other. Uh, and uh, then, uh, so they're gonna pull it down to like 120, in, uh, you know, so four, what's that, 40, 40, 40, <laughs> uh, per partisan group. They'll, then they're gonna do interviews. And then uh, after that, basically the legislature will have a chance to strike a few, but at the end of this long process, 
uh, the auditor will, will be doing bingo balls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so the auditor basically next August will do bingo balls to select uh, eight randomly eight random com commissioners randomly. So we'll select three Democrats, three Republicans, two others at random, and then those last those eight will select the final six from the remainder of the pool that the auditor has put together. To, to because randomization is obviously going to not probably not create a reflective pool. So that, and then that the group of eight will kind of select the last six to kind of try to compensate for where are the geographic needs or some diverse needs or some experience needs, et cetera. But it is a very long process. Uh, please go to the webpage and please email me directly. I will happily uh, talk you through it uh, if you're seriously interested in and you know, we will guide you because we are, we are looking for uh, great people and I know there's many on this call. Okay, the next question says, um, I guess they're asking for, for your opinion. Um, do, these question, do these rules inherently disenfranchise already marginalized um, communities? Uh, I guess like the rigidness of, of the qualification. So, I mean, it, it does, in my opinion, it does put, start us from behind. Again, remember California is about 40% of the total pop, you know, 30% of the CVAP, 26% of the reg, and at the moment we are at 11.5% of the tentatively eligible applicant pool. Uh, you know, because we also, we're still a younger population, so therefore, you know, a lot of younger voters are probably not going to meet the five-year registration history. Mm -hmm. So that kind of by implication means you have a minimum age of 23. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and we have, uh, Historically, you know, there have been turnout issues for our community. So if you have to vote two, two out of the last three elections, you know, it could put us at a disadvantage as well. That said, after this process is done, we do still have the opportunity to kind of like lobby and we still are the state auditor to try to put, they do have rules into place, try to put pools together that are as representative as possible. What representative means can be open to interp interpretation. You know, we, they, we can't have qu quotas. Uh, you know, Prop 209, uh, in which is passed in California in the 90s, uh, does, you know, make it, you know, does make it illegal to kind of say specifically a certain amount. But they, you know, it does mean if we have a qualified Latino or Latina, we probably do have an opportunity to at least elevate that person through advocacy uh, uh, into to, to consideration. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, we have a question about is the information, uh, is the applicant information made public? Uh, so if you go to the auditor's webpage, the, uh, initially just the statistical tallies are, uh, are just our statistics. If you start advancing in the process though, there is a certain point where it does, where things do become put on the webpage. So uh, I believe your like letters of recommendation uh, will, might be on the webpage. Definitely your interviews, when the interviews are, are, are done, uh, you know, the interviews will be video recorded and put on the web page. So you will have some, you will be a public figure essentially, uh, once, this, like once you go deep into this process. So uh, yes, that is a consideration. Um, is, will there be any like personal information, like contact information, your address, your tax information? Not that. I don't believe that. But they will. You know, you're. It's. You know, you're applying for a public position, so you know your resume, whatever you turn in, will be on. <laughs> you know, we should. will probably be made public. Your work. You know, that type of work history. Uh, I don't think you're, you, know, you need your salaries, uh, but uh, you know. Um, e that that will be on, uh, and again, also this is also they also will be asking you to list uh, family. They'll be your family won't information won't be put on, but you know during the initial process they will at least bet for it. Okay. Um. Let me see. Someone's asking about bilingual or monolingual representation. Um, does that? I'm not sure what she meant by that, but does that? Are they tracking that? Um, they, no, they are, in theory, you know, a, someone who is only Spanish speaking could participate on the commission, but 
I mean, all the commission processes will be done in English, although, you know, majority of the testimony will be in English. So you, pro it's, you probably will need to be at minimum bilingual, uh, you know, uh, because everything will be in English, you know, and when the process happens, at least last time, you know, the commissioners put in rules for translation services, especially if they were taking testimony in an area that had a lot high uh, linguistically isolated uh, 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 community. Like I remember what LA City had, obviously had to have a large Spanish speaking translation of it, translator available. So when people give testimony, uh, the people testifying have the chance to cap translation service. Um, the bilingual process will, per, I'm sure, will be flagged as a resume item, you know, and that is a plus. We had Spanish-speaking commissioners, which, and last time, and that was very helpful because, you know, often interpreters, you know, they're going, they're doing, I'm sure they're doing their best, but sometimes they miss it or miss the feeling of something, and it is helpful to have a commissioner to kind of like get the proper cadence. Um, and then our one of the we have two more questions. The next one is. Um, do you have any recommendations for letters of reference? Um, is this a highly political appointment where we should look for legislators to provide those letters? Uh, I will, uh, I think that's a question, uh, email me. Uh, that's the best practices on that part. I will, and, you know, so I don't have that answer at the moment, you okay. know, of who's the best recommender. I mean, off the top of my head, probably someone non-political. Mm -hmm. uh, you want letters of rec from people who are community-minded themselves. Like if you have someone you thought would be a good commissioner, but they chose not to for some reason, but they're highly engaged and they can vouch for your civic mindedness, your ability to listen, your patience, uh, your ability to listen to people of different uh, mindsets. Uh, you know, cause trust me, all sides of both aisles will be there at these hearings. Uh, and so, you know, you will be listening to extremes on both sides at times. Uh, so, you know, again, so all, going back to the, what I, and, you know, we can send out this PowerPoint of what makes a good commissioner, those are probably good, qual good rule of thumb of what makes a good recommender as well. Um, okay, and then I had someone ask a question about the census application. They wanted to know if, um, if Latinos can, do Latinos need to choose a race or can they just choose the ethnicity question? Uh, so you are asked to do both. So that's why it's separate. So, uh, I mean, in statistical inside baseball, usually Latinos, when it comes to the race question, will you like, like 45% of them will select white, 45% will select other because they'll say, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not, not a, white. <laughs> not an X, Y, or Z. Uh, so that's why, uh, so yes, yeah, so that's why usually you have to kind of, you, you do, they do request that you select both, you answer both questions, uh, you know, but like, you know, it's from our community's perspective, it's a little colorist essentially. So, you know, I'm a fair skinned Latino, so I'll, I often will put one. Uh, others, uh, often, many others will say, oh, they'll put indigenous and Native American because if they want to be proud of their indigenous roots. Uh, and many just put others because it's like none of these other categories, race yeah. categories are me. It's your story. Ultimately, the census to me is, 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 is our story. You know, the, you know, over time, you know, that's the story of our country. Uh, and uh, it has evolved over time, but now you can do mixed race, for example. But, uh, you know, so it gives us more information. And it's just it's a part of our story at the end of the day as well. Okay, and our last question is really about um, kind of the, how the redistricting commission came about, the rules, and is there any opportunity to kind of revisit some of those requirements um, or I know it was I know you mentioned earlier in our personal conversation before we started that it was a, uh, a, a ballot measure right yes so uh, the Commission came about uh, uh, because of two ballot measures prop 11 in 2008 and prop 20 in 2010 prop 11 basically created the Commission and made the, let the Commission be in charge of Assembly Senate and Board of Equalization then prop 20 was made to add Congress uh, I my understanding is basically they did that because at the time they wanted to, first the ballot, it was a strategic question because the ballot initiative, the ballot authors wanted to avoid challenges by congressional members. And then they said, oh yeah, and then they assured, yeah, they assured the congressional delegation, yeah, yeah, we're not gonna add Congress. Then they added it anyways. <laughs> uh, so, um, the, so it's ballot measure. So any substantive changes would have to be another ballot measure. 
Like for example, Prop 20 did amend Prop 11 a little bit. It did more than just add Congress. It added, it changed the timeline that actually made it a shorter timeline when the commission had to pass their, their, uh, their maps, uh, like by, by three or four weeks. Uh, that was bad in my opinion, because you want as much time as possible. And it also added like some more definitions of like a community of interest, but more specific uh, definition. Uh, so, but changes like that are, you know, come from the ballot, like increasing the size, getting rid of the partisanship makeup, you know, uh, you know, changing this application process, essentially, that's a ballot measure adjustment. Okay. Um, and then we got to thank you, Mr. Ochoa. <laughs> uh, so I think there's, that was the last question. Um, any, sorry, if you or anyone you know is interested, they should reach back to Malta first. Um, so yeah, so if anyone is interested, um, in applying or learning more about the process, are they okay to reach out to you? Please, please do. We're, um, uh, Diana will put my email back up again. Uh, email is the best way to go get a hold of me, because, uh, like you know, technology and all, you know, that's our that's our uh, new drug, right? Uh, either that or coffee. So um, <laughs> please email me if you have any more specific questions. If you want to apply, again, even if you're just considering it for a split second, apply. This part is quick, and it's you, but you have to do it by August 9th. Uh, afterwards, when we get to the nitty gritty, we, you know, then we, you have more time to say, uh, maybe not. But even if you're just considering it, it's a 1% chance, apply right now. Because we really do need qualified people. The HOPE network is excellent. Uh, and remember, I'm a HOPE brother-in-law. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I'm here to help. <laughs> uh, and so please, yeah, email me at any time. Email. Diana, Belinda, Helen, I'm sure if she's listening, let's get her, everyone, they need more love too. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Um, I think that, that was the last question. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I know it's one of the rather large, lo longer um, webinars that we've had, but uh, I think this is important information and it's probably going to be a subject of conversation for the next couple of years. So we wanted to make sure you have all the information that you need and that you can get as involved as possible as you can have time for it. I just again want to say thank you and thank you, Steve. Um, Diana showed me earlier, um, people said that this is being well received. So All right. I think that the <laughs> fact that you're here even starting this conversation and making our women aware of this, I mean, our women are already civically engaged and they love this stuff. I just kind of worried like all those requirements because we always push for them to serve on boards and commissions. Yeah. And if there's a 10 year Mm -hmm. You know that you can't be doing that. That's something. Uh, but to your point, there's so many other women out there that we could be asking to do the same. So. I, I will also put. Uh, sorry, one thing I will mention, probably if, for those of you considering it, if you do happen to serve on the commission, if you are one of the fourteen, you are restricted from running for office, <laughs> state office. You can't run for anything you draw or a statewide office uh, uh, afterwards. Is there a time frame? Yeah, ten years. Ten, oh, ten years. Ten years. Oh, okay. Every time. Uh, and, and technically, your tenure is through the decade and. Like the commissioners will hold the hand, like ever through the drive process, they just hold a handful of meetings here and there to talk about redistricting. But but the intense part is during will be during twenty end of twenty twenty through twenty eleven. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Steve. I, we couldn't do this without you and Diana. Thank you for pulling this all together. Um, and we just want to thank everybody who joined us. All thank right. you all. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, this is recorded. So we will send out the recording to everyone along with the slides. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>